Hello, <laughs> welcome to another adventure. Um, I am Anthony Wright de Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. And uh, this is Archival Adventures, my weekly uh, live stream program coming at you from Newman Library here at Virginia Tech, where we're gonna look at things from um, special collections and university archives together. Um, I have not. Uh, really looked through the materials before we see them on stream. That's sort of, you know, the way that the program has been running since I started. This is episode number 74, I think? Yeah, 74 episodes now. Um, so, yeah, uh, hopefully you're all having a good day. Hello, Key Squared. Hello, Fluid Anne. Hello, Shadows of Life. It's good to see you all. Um, I should make sure I can see the other chat on the other computer. Um, if you're new here and you don't know, 
I stream this out to two different channels. This goes out to twitch.tv slash vtulstudios, which is the library's channel. And I also stream this out on my own channel, which is twitch.tv slash rogan27. And I do that purely because it raises the number of people that actually show up. Uh, and I'm, I'm all about trying to reach as many people as possible. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, I distracted myself by talking about that. But um, yeah, if you're new to the program, um, once a week, I share stuff from the archives here. Uh, we're going to have a couple of um, things to talk about about today's collection as they come up. But also, uh, I'll, I'll do a more substantial sort of content warning than I usually do, just because the person uh, whose papers we're looking at today is somewhat of a controversial figure. Um, you may not have heard of him, but uh, I feel some uh, prefacing to what we're going to see um, would just be good form. But before we get into any of that, hi, Lord Portico. Um, I'm also just going to, to say, um, yes, there is a bright red dot on my forehead. Um, and that is um, for any younger viewers out there. Um, I'm sorry to tell you that as you continue to age, you will still continue to have blemishes. And <laughs> sometimes they're going to be in um, awkward places. So yes, there is um, a, a blemish on my forehead that is extra bright uh, thanks to all the um, studio lighting and, and studio cameras. Um, and my lack of uh, concealer and makeup owing to the fact that I was raised in the United States and was never t taught how to use any of that. Maybe something to look into the, into for the future. Anyway, <laughs> just, you know, wanted to get that out there in case anybody was staring at it saying, what? Uh, once, once we move to the documents, it'll be smaller and, and less distracting. Um, but we like to start this stream by reading Virginia Tech's land and labor acknowledgement. So that is what I'm going to do. Um, <clears throat> This is the official land and labor acknowledgement from the university. And there should be a link uh, popping into the chat with that. Um, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tutelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty offerings and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved Black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to Utprosim, that I may serve, uh, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So that is the official land and labor acknowledgement from the university. And um, hello there, 16-bit Eric. Thank you so much for bringing the whimsies over. Uh, welcome in, everybody, to um, my Wednesday stream. Uh, this is a show called Archival Adventures, where I share materials from Special Collections and University Archives at Virginia Tech. Um, so historic documents, uh, usually I've not looked at them in advance, so I don't know exactly what's going to be there. Today's episode is um, Scientific Unorthodoxies. We're looking at the Henry H. Bauer papers. Um, and there's significant material on the Loch Ness Monster, as well as some other um, sort of uh, unusual uh, science things. One of the folders I pulled is called Cryptozoology. I don't really know what's in any of them, um, so that's part of what we're going to do today. Uh, but let me say hello to everybody who's here um, and, and welcome you all in. I hope that you all had a good time hanging out with Eric and uh, playing Earthbound um, and that you're ready for some hopefully interesting content. Um, the Bauer Papers, there should be a finding aid, and Lord Portico has beaten me to it. Uh, thank you, Lord Portico, for um, 
dropping that in. I've got the, the finding aid linked in uh, the other channel's chat now as well. Um, that takes you to a general description of what is in the collection and then a listing by box. Um, if you see something on the finding aid that you would like to have me look at on stream, do let me know. I will note that today I only have a couple of the boxes from the collection. Um, so when you get to the listing, the topics that are possible for me to show on stream today uh, would be items in boxes 1, 2, 3, 8, 9, and 15. Those are the only boxes I physically have present with me today. So 1, 2, 3, 8, 9, and 15. Um, and I have those specifically because they had something on the Loch Ness Monster or on um, unusual science, um, things like that. And that was the focus of today's stream. So before we dive into the documents themselves, I do want to say, uh, I want to give a little bit of background on Henry Bauer, um, why we have his papers, and why there are portions of the collection I'm not likely to show on stream. Uh, <laughs> and this is going to be uh, the historical terms um, uh, command would be useful here. Um, So Henry H. Bauer, uh, biographical information, born in Austria in 1931, Dr. Henry H. Bauer um, received a PhD in 1956 from the University of Sydney, Australia. Uh, he uh, w is an emeritus professor of chemistry and science studies and emeritus dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, which is uh, the long legal name for Virginia Tech. Uh, he frequently wrote and spoke about scientific unorthodoxies, um, for example, the Loch Ness Monster or um, Velikovsky, uh, ethics in science, as well as the politics of higher education. Uh, he is one of the founding members of the Society for Scientific Exploration and served as editor-in-chief for the Journal of Scientific Exploration from 2000 to 2007. He's published several books, including The Enigma of the Loch Ness Monster, Making Sense of a Mystery uh, in 1986, Beyond Velikovsky, uh, The History of a Public Controversy, published in 1984, and To Rise Above Principle, The Memoirs of an Unreconstructed Dean in 1988, which was published under the pen name Joseph Martin. Um, if you look at the listing of materials, you will see some topics that might be concerning, which is why um, the historical terms command uh, comes into play. I, I Switching from our official finding a description of him um, over to Wikipedia, I'm just going to read a little bit about the introduction to his page on Wikipedia, which is um, Henry Herman Bauer is an emeritus professor of chemistry and science studies at Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. So far, pretty much the same. He is the author of several books and articles on fringe science arguing in favor of the existence of the Loch Ness Monster and against Emanuel Velikovsky, which I know the name. I don't really know what Velikovsky is. Some of these papers will hopefully inform me on that. He's also an AIDS denialist, which honestly makes me question any of his scientific positions. I think it's very interesting that he was the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, which is not a science college. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, just yeah, following his retirement, he was the editor in chief of the Journal of Scientific Exploration, a fringe science publication. Um, and yeah, the College of Arts and Sciences, um, oh yeah, and, and it ends with, uh, he served as Dean of College of Arts and Scienti Sciences, generating controversy by criticizing affirmative action. So not exactly a role model, but that doesn't mean that there won't be information that we will find interesting. Um, the departments included under the College of Arts and Sciences, just for your uh, understanding, this is the Department of English, the Department of History, 
um, human development, modern and classical languages and literature, philosophy, political science, religion and culture, uh, things like that. It is not where chemistry, biology, um, and the hard sciences, medical stuff falls. He was the dean of the college that does English and history and things like that, not of a science college. Um, yes, Shadows of Life, concern. So that, uh, I do have a couple of the AIDS-related folders. They are not among the chief ones that I plan on looking at today. Um, I just wanted to like have a caution. Uh, we're mostly going to be looking at like the Loch Ness Monster and Velikovsky stuff, the stuff from like the mid eighties, um, that is more fun, <laughs> um, than at, uh, some of the more concerning things that are in this collection. But I did want to note that it is there. So. <laughs> As we dive in, uh, once again, if you do see something on the finding aid in boxes one, two, three, eight, nine, or 15 uh, that you'd like me to pull out, do let me know and I will make an effort to show them. Um, so with that, I say we actually start looking at some documents here. Um, and the first ones that I'm going to pull out, Loch Ness. <laughs> the, the first two that I have here are, uh, these are from box 13. Um, you can see behind it, I have some box 15 stuff as well. Uh, but box 13, Loch Ness and Anomalistics, which these are actually like, just like file folders directly from uh, directly from his files. Actually, it looks like I, I also somehow pulled a folder called Political Correctness, which I'm probably not going to dive into that one. Also, uh, if, if you are interested in, in having opinions on the things that we look at today, um, generally open to that. This is an educational space. Uh, just make sure that you're keeping them um, respectful. Um, otherwise, we have moderators. So uh, let's see what's in this Loch Ness folder. How about? Does anybody um, know very much about the Loch Ness Monster, the kind of science involved in trying to... Uh, Prove, its, prove or disprove its ex existence. I know last week um, on stream, I mentioned that there had been recent news about um, some dinosaur fossil discoveries that implied that a creature such as what the Loch Ness Monster is supposed to look, supposed, supposed to look like um, would have been possible. I looked into that a little bit more and basically it was the first time that uh, dinosaurs of that type had been found in an area where they knew there was fresh water. So at least the Loch Ness Mon Monster would have been biologically plausible, but yet still no chance that one of those dinosaurs survived to today. So <laughs> you've read a few sources, but they all seemed pretty fishy. Uh, Key squared, thank you. I think that one deserves points. Uh, just a bit about the myth. So um, I, f I think the Loch Ness Monster is just uh, a fun thing to uh, kind of explore. Um, so let's see, the first things that we have in here, I've got two letters here. Uh, it does appear they are out of chronological sequence, so I'm going to start actually with the first one and then we'll look at the second one. Um, so this one uh, is a letter from Andreas Trotman in um, Switzerland, dated September 25th, 1991. Um, and as always, I have no idea what's in this. I've not read it before. We're seeing it for the first time together. Um, 
Dear Henry, by way of the last ISC newsletter, I was informed of your successful completion of the Nessie Bibliography. Certainly this was not an easy task, but I think all crypto cryptozoologists interested in this enigma should and are very thankful for your valuable work. May I therefore ask you to please provide me with one complete set of diskettes, nine in total, as mentioned in the newsletter. Unfortunately, the CPM system is no longer available in Switzerland, therefore I would prefer the copies on DOS system if possible. Please find enclosed US $40 in cash for the cost, diskettes, postage, etc. And please let me know if this amount isn't sufficient. I prefer to send you the cash instead of other diskettes, mainly that you can make your correct choice of diskettes. I hope that your health conditions have improved and that the special Loch Ness atmosphere was advantageous for it. I intended to be back at the Loch this November, but due to our move to another part of Switzerland this same month, we have to postpone it for next spring. May I also ask you to please note my new address. Awaiting with great interest the diskettes, I remain with many, many thanks and my best regards to you and your wife, Barbara. Yours sincerely, Andreas. Um, <laughs> so just apparently asking for like a copy of the Nessie bibliography, which totally makes sense. Sorry, the chair is there. I apologize for shifting so much. Um, asking for some copies of the files uh, for the bibliography, which totally a thing, academics, Honestly, it is, it is not a well-guarded secret that if you can't afford the um, cost of getting an article directly from the journal, a lot of academics will contact the person who wrote an article and just ask for a copy of it, and sometimes they'll get it. Um, so asking for a copy of this bibliography and even providing money to buy the discs and send it um, is, is not bad. Uh, also, it seems like they might know each other. I do find it interesting in here in the second part, it actually, uh, he talks about the CPM system no longer being available. We actually have a computer in our archives that runs CPM and I had to, uh, it actually runs CPM too. And in uh, trying to process it and um, be able to fully describe it, uh, meaning, be able to say what was on all the disks that came with it. Um, I had to teach myself CPM2, uh, which was a computer operating system from before DOS was in common usage. Um, so uh, I'm actually kind of surprised to see it talked about in 91. I, I honestly thought CPM was well out the door by 91. Um, the, the machine that we have in our archives is an Osborne 1, uh, which was one of the first um, portable computers. It's about the size of a portable sewing machine. Um, about that time that you noticed that the diskette was about eight stories tall and a crustacean from the Protozoic era. Oh, Triamas. Uh, that seems appropriate for the topic today. Uh, so then we have another letter from Andreas, uh, October 14th, 1991. This one handwritten, so might take me a, a little bit more to try and read it. Dear Henry, many thanks for your quick, rep quick reply. May I ask you to please send me the Nessie bibliography on the following sort of diskettes. DOS system, three and a half inch, um, 1.2... M, I'm not sure what 1.2 large M was with three and a half inch floppies. I just can't remember. Um, Cause it would be MB if it was like megabyte or I, I, I don't remember. If anybody does remember, that'd be lovely. HD, uh, please put the difference of the respective amount, uh, US dollars 40 in the research fund of your department. With many thanks and my best regards, yours sincerely, Andreas. 
It could be megabyte. That's where my brain goes to. But typically, I would have expected it to be written MB. Although, I suppose just a capital M could be used to denote the difference between a megabit and a megabyte. So a megabit would be like a lowercase m, and a megabyte would be an uppercase m. Uh, I could see that being a thing. I honestly have no idea what the common abbreviations were in 91 and whether there was any difference between those used in the US and those in Switzerland. Um, we've got more stuff here from Andreas Trotman. August 17th or 7th, 1994. I'm just going to move this because um, it's doubtful that that phone number is still good, but let's not keep it on screen any longer than we need to. Uh, August 7th, 1994. Dear Henry, thank you very much for your letter. The kind, uh, the kind remarks on my Loch Ness report and the information on the Society for Scientific Exploration. Indeed, I would be most interested to join your society as an associate member. Please find, therefore, the respective details enclosed, and I would be most grateful if you could pass them on to the SSE Secretary, Professor L. W. Frederick. Please note the following correction to my statement in the Loch Ness report concerning an undated article on a Nessie sighting out of the Loch Ness submarine. My interpretation on the name of one of the submarine pilots, uh, Gordon Swindles, is wrong. In different newspaper articles, such as in the Evening Standard on March, March 29th, 1994, and in different issues of the Inverness Courier, he was definitely mentioned as a member of the crew. Nevertheless, the name of the photographer, Paolo Rilf, is a well-known anagram of April Fool. Uh, <clears throat> awaiting with great interest the news of the Society for Scientific Exploration, I remain with my best wishes to you and your wife. Yours sincerely, Andreas. <clears throat> Capacity sounds about right for a high-density disc, which would have been what the HD stood for. <clears throat> yeah, it's been a long time since I really did a lot with three and a half inch floppies. Um, I've more recently worked with uh, five and a quarter floppies and with zip drives. <clears throat> five and a quarter floppies were 1.2 megabytes. Thank you, Triamas. That is relevant information. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> pardon me. 91 to 94, I think, is pre zip drive, wanna be sayery. Um, 3.5 were 1.44 megabytes. And so, this is asking for a 1.2 megabyte. Which. Uncertain, just uncertain. And you know, <laughs> that, that is peripheral to the discussion of, of the Loch Ness Monster. But, uh, but yeah, I think this is still pre-zip drive. I think zip drives came uh, closer to the end of the 90s, or at least came into regular usage closer to the end of the 90s. So um, I think this ends up being a lot of correspondence about the Loch Ness Monster in this folder, is, is at least what it looks like. Uh, you know more about floppy disks than Nessie? Hey, that's fine, and we never know what we're going to find. Like I said, I have not explored, like I really haven't dug through this other than I pulled folders because I literally did not have enough cart space. Um, this collection has like 23 folders, I think, something like that. I pulled 11 of them. But the cart that I bring up here only has space for six boxes. So the, 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 sorry, the collection had about 23 boxes. I pulled 11 of them out of storage uh, based on what was in the finding aid. <clears throat> but I only have space on the cart for a maximum of six boxes, maybe eight boxes if I want to double stack the top shelf. Um, and so I have whole boxes where most of the box seemed somewhat relevant to the topic. And then I have folders that I pulled out of other boxes. Um, so we don't have the full freedom of the entire collection today, uh, which is why boxes 1, 2, 3, 8, 9, and 15 
are the ones that I directed you to for potential topics to look at. Uh, Trotman is still writing for a cryptozoology website. Interesting. Yeah, I think some of these people are still around. So, I, I, in fact, I'm, I think Bauer himself is still around. Um, let's see, October 3rd, 1988. Dear Dr. Bauer, I received your packet with Nessie information. From a news standpoint, the material is a little dated, so I can't use it right now. I'm keeping it in my crypto critter file, however. Please let me know if something new breaks on Nessie this fall, as you indicated. I'd be particularly interested if you or someone else from Virginia were to get involved. Sincerely, Rex Springsteen, um, who was apparently with the Richmond News Leader, which would have been a newspaper in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I guess Bauer had reached out to him. I, I, I just love that he's got a crypto critter file, which... They're interesting topics. And this all would have been like before, um, I don't know about those of you outside the US, but within the US, um, there was a cable network uh, known as the Learning Channel um, that then changed names to just TLC um, and went from very educational programming to very sort of tabloidish programming. And in that transition started doing a lot of like pseudoscience type stuff. Um, so things along the lines of, and, and in fact, I think, I think the History Channel might have done as well. I, I sort of stopped watching after things like Ancient Aliens and stuff like that started to show up um, because I was there for actual educational content. And so when it started to become sort of this pseudoscience, I, I moved away from it. Um, but it is, it is very much a thing that is popular with, uh, with the, a mass audience. All right. <clears throat> I have a typed document here that was printed on a dot matrix printer, and I know that because it's got the little um, rough sides from removing the uh, perforated dot line that would have fed it through the dot matrix printer. Um, and you can see little bits of, of that remain. Anyway, also just the quality of the printing. Um, I don't know what most of the header information at the top means, but page one of seven, the Richmond News Leader, date Thursday, July 24th, 1986, section Virginia, illustration, photo, and drawing, um, Rex Springsteen, the author, Dateline, Eastern Maryland. Chessie is still splashing around. They've got that double underlined. I'm guessing that might mean that it is uh, meant to be Nessie and was a mistake. Um, Jack H. Bishop was sober as a dentist, which is what he is, when he saw something that looked like a gigantic snake in the Tread Avon River just southwest of here. Okay, so maybe it is meant to be Chessie. Um, Dr. Bishop was with a friend, Ken Boudry, a furniture store owner. They were on Boudry's dock on the river, an eastern shore tributary of the Chesapeake Bay. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, so Chessie, like, Nessie is the name of the Loch Ness Monster, so this would be, Chessie would be a similar type creature in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, they saw a creature 20 feet or more long, some one and a half feet wide, and moving in up and down undulations, Dr. Bishop said. It appeared to be swimming about 100 yards offshore. A couple of arches would go under, then another would come up, Dr. Bishop said. This thing was big. I wouldn't want to be swimming next to it. Uh, thus, on May 25th, Dr. Bishop and Boudry became the latest people to spot the mysterious thing that Bay Area residents affectionately call Chessie. More than 30 people have reported seeing the creature in the Bay and its tributaries since 1978. No one knows what it is, a seal creating a long wake, a mirage of sorts, or as its spotters say, a strange snake-like animal. 
but scientists who have examined the phenomenon have not debunked Chessie's existence. Dr. Arthur Goldfinger, a, a physicist at the Applied Physics Lab of Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, used a computer to examine a videotape of the creature and did not rule out the possibility of a snake-like animal inhabiting the bay. Is anybody else confused about why a physicist was consulted on the existence of an animal in the bay? And the authenticity of a videotape of an animal in the bay? Uh, like, that seems like something you would want a biologist for. I don't really understand why a physicist was consulted there. Uh, when you have a lot of reputable, intelligent people talking about something like this, you have to wonder what's going on, Dr. Goldfinger said. Uh, some of them have a lot to lose by coming forward with this story. It's not the usual snake oil salesmen who are making these reports. Dr. Bishop, 41, tanned, handsome, and affable, became a local celebrity after his chessy sighting. He was even featured on page one of the weekly World News tabloid. Fluid dynamics? I don't know, sober as a dentist. Yeah, sober as a dentist? I've never seen that phrase in my life. Don't, I don't know that dentists particularly have a reputation for being sober. And as you note, uh, the first thing that popped into my head when I read that phrase was Little Shop of Horrors. Uh, not to be confused with the much cuter Chessie, who was the cat mascot of the old CNO Railroad. Oh, Simsilica, thank you for, I, I, I wasn't looking at chat at the time, but you immediately knew what Chessie uh, was, was meant to indicate. Think of a drunken dentist. Pure horror. Uh, this is true. Interesting, I did not know that there was a cat mascot for the CNO Railroad. I don't know whether we have any CNO things. Um, we do have a railroad collection. It's not one of our main uh, collecting areas now. Um, now I have to see. Um, just looking hey, we do have a couple of things. Like we in our maps collection, we have a Chesapeake and Ohio Railway tourist map of the Warm Springs Valley. There's a couple mentions in our finding aids of CNO. Um, it, it's not the main railway that we tend to have material on, uh, but I, might have to look and see if I can find somewhere in our collection a picture of, of Chessie, the, the railroad mascot. I think all dot matrix printers used continuous paper, but not all printers which used continuous paper were dot matrix. Right. Right. And, and that is a great term for it. I did not know that's what it was called, continuous paper, but it makes perfect sense. I'm not going to read the rest of this seven-page uh, news article, but um, I think that's an interesting one. Let's see what else we got. We have an article here uh, from the Associated Press that was published in the Montgomery County News Messenger on 18 January 1987. Uh, Montgomery County, Virginia is the county that Virginia Tech is, is that our main campus is located within. Um, Bauer says much evidence may support the monster's existence. Uh, I love the, does the creature exist? And they don't say what monster it is. I'm guessing this article probably had a photograph with it. Um, but I, I can't be certain because this is all I got. Um, anyway, a Virginia Tech professor who has written a book about the Loch Ness Monster says there is much evidence that the creature actually exists. Dr. Henry Bauer, professor of chemistry and science studies, said Friday night that he has been fascinated with the Loch Ness Monster since the early 1970s when he met a man who shot a movie sequence purporting to show the creature. His interest prompted him to write a book. 
the enigma of Loch Ness, making sense of a mystery. Bauer told about 120 people at Randolph-Macon College that many people, including most of his colleagues, consider the monster a hoax. He said much of the material combined by people who claim to have seen the monster is indeed fake or compiled by... Uh, the real difficulty is deciding which is good evidence and which is spurious evidence, said Bauer. Bauer, a native of Austria who was raised in Australia, said the Loch Ness Monster may be, may be not one beast, but a population of animals that were distributed quite widely around the world and became landlocked. Uh, sightings of creatures with large bodies, long necks, and small heads have been reported in many Scottish lochs or lakes other than Ness. While studying in England in 1972-73, Bauer visited Loch Ness and met Tim Dinsdale, a British aeronautical engineer who shot a film sequence in the early 1960s that he claimed showed the Loch Ness Monster. Uh, the film was examined by the Royal Air Force, which confirmed that it showed something large moving in the water, Bauer said. Bauer said Dinsdale seemed sincere, and I couldn't disbelieve him. Uh, Bauer showed a copy of Dinsdale's film, as well as slides purportedly showing monster heads and fins taken over five decades. He, had, he said some appeared real, others fake. Bauer said he empathizes with people who claim to have seen a snake-like monster nicknamed Chessie in the Chesapeake Bay. You don't know what to do, he said. It's very frustrating to sit on Loch Ness or on the Chesapeake Bay and wait. You can spend a lifetime. Hi, Mr. Licorice. <laughs> Finally awake at 7 a.m. for an archives stream. Uh, welcome. Yeah, we're talking about Loch Ness. Uh, we've got uh, the papers of uh, Henry Bauer, uh, who was faculty here at Virginia Tech, um, originally from Austria, was raised in Australia, and then um, he focused on uh, l primarily the Loch Ness Monster and Velikovsky um, as like two areas that he did significant work on and later in his career um, <clears throat> a number of things about uh, denying that HIV caused AIDS. So not, um, not always a reliable <laughs> source. Um, basically, uh, scientific unorthodoxy is our, our, our focus today, um, uh, and he argued in favor of the Loch Ness Monster's existence, uh, yeah. So, very much, yeah. Okay, wait, so there's a, a monster supposed to be in Lake Champlain, Named Champy? Amazing. <coughs> so, but the primary thing we're focusing on today is the Loch Ness Monster. I'm going to look at some point, we'll, we'll switch over and look at some of the Velikovsky stuff, because I'm curious about what it is. I recognize the name, but I have nothing beyond the fact that I recognize the name. Uh, I, I know nothing about what that is as a topic. Uh, we will not be looking at um, his third area, which was AIDS denialism. Because um, I just don't want to put that on the internet. So, uh, so we have an Associated Press short article here. Um, trying to make out what the date is. Um, January 19th, but I don't know what year. Does anybody see a year on here? I've got multiple places in the header. I've got January 19th. It's January 19th here as well. But it says 0635, which this was definitely not an Associated Press article from January 19th of 635. So I don't know what year this was. <coughs> uh, but, so this was 
uh, Virginia News Briefs by the Associated Press. Ashland, Virginia. A Virginia Tech chemistry professor says the Loch Ness Monster may be more than just one beast. Again, when we had the article about Chessie, their scientist talking about how he couldn't, he couldn't disprove the video was a physicist. And here we've got a chemistry professor right weighing in on the existence of a creature that I would be expecting either an archaeologist or a biologist or an evolutionary biologist or so some, somebody related to biology, not chemistry. Um, the monster may be, quote, a population of animals that were distributed out uh, quite widely around the world and became landlocked, unquote, said Dr. Henry Bauer, a professor of chemistry and science studies. Bauer told a gathering at Randolph-Macon College Friday, uh, so essentially the same details as what we had in the previous one that I already read. <clears throat> he was just happy to be interviewed. Yeah. <laughs> So, I, I mean, all of this stuff is in our archives because he was a dean. Uh, he, I mean, he was a professor here uh, who taught chemistry and then later was a dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, which does not do hard sciences, does English, history, philosophy, um, things like that. Uh, we have a, let's see. Article here from 87 from the Richmond News Leader um, that includes a photograph, the 1961 uh, photograph of Nessie. So that one's, that's a, a fairly famous uh, photograph, poorly reproduced in this photocopy of a newspaper article. <laughs> so definitely not a high quality uh, in that, in that case. Oh, but there's a letter with that one. Do we care? Yeah, sure. So this is uh, a, a letter from Rex Springston, um, who we had seen uh, a note from earlier, the, the, the reporter who had a, um, a Crypto Critters file. Uh, Dear Dr. Bauer, January 19th, 1987, I enjoyed your presentation the other night. Here is a copy of the story I wrote along with the pics you loaned me. Also, the story I wrote was picked by the Associated Press in condensed form. The AP version could have run in any paper across the state that subscribes to that wire service. I suspect some papers near Blacksburg ran it. I've included here a copy of the AP story. I will send a copy of the Nessie story to Richard Greenwell, as you asked. Let me apologize for the inaccuracy of the picture cut line, which says... Uh, the famous Nessie shot was taken in 1961. Um, honestly, I have no idea when it was taken. I just know it's a fairly famous photo. Um, an editor who handled the picture wrote that. The pic was one of two of the same shot, one large, one small, in our file. One was labeled as having been, been taken in 1934. The other was labeled incorrectly. Unfortunately, the editor used the latter one. In hopes of interesting you in taking a look at Chessie in the Chesapeake Bay, I will pass on a name, Robert Bob Frew, a down-to-earth businessman who took the videotape of the, of the animal. I called him and he said it would be fine if I passed on his number, and that's where we stopped looking at the document. Uh, but <laughs> Interesting. I, I do like when we sort of discover like a, a back and forth conversation in letters. Um, we did that when we were looking at the, uh, we were looking at the papers of a bird dealer last summer um, and found a whole series of letters with uh, somebody who was raising birds up in New England um, looking for specific breeds and then had problems where uh, some of the birds were attacking other birds and they were having weather problems. And, and then all of a sudden, he had come down south uh, for a visit and we had this long letter about his history in the military and uh, visiting the DC area. And um, 
It was really neat to come across that in what were essentially business files for uh, uh, this local business that sold um, that sold birds to people who raised birds. Uh, <laughs> we do care, or do we care? Yeah. Forget how scary just normal fish and sturgeon and catfish. Yeah. Well, so catfish will grow, honestly, they will continue to grow until they reach a certain size in, in, in relation to the environment that they're in. So if you put them in a larger tank, they get bigger. If, if you, or not catfish, I'm thinking goldfish, but, but you're right. Sturgeon, tuna are enormous. Um, like, but yeah, my brain, what I was saying about catfish, I realized is not about catfish, it's about goldfish. Um, that goldfish will grow to fit the size of the environment that they're in. So if you get a baby goldfish and you put it in a small tank, it's not gonna grow super big. If you put it in a bigger tank, it's gonna grow bigger. <laughs> Letters. Before folks had the outlet of blog posts to share all their life details, indeed. Bird Breeder Digest in your eBay searches. Oh yeah, I remember. Hi, was not worth it. Um, that was that was a whole thing where we were trying to identify that publication. Um, Loch Ness Lodge Hotel in Inverness. It was just a tiny little card from from that hotel. Kind of interesting there. Um, I'm not. We have a lot more stuff, um, so I'm probably going to move on from this folder, and we'll look at some more of the stuff. Uh, I'm just looking, flipping through to see if there's any like images or anything, but this seems to be a letter file. Um, let's see what else we have. So the next folder, the one behind the Loch Ness folder, was a folder that had an interesting title, which is the only reason I grabbed it, Anomalistics, which I have no idea what that means. Uh, and so I thought, let's find out. Um, let's see, we have a pamphlet in here, Center for Scientific Anomalies Research. Um, czar. They're just making words up now. Well, you know, most, actually, in fact, all words were made up at some point. <laughs> all words are made up, yeah. <laughs> Logically, shouldn't the folder behind Loch Ness be unlocked Ness? Key squared. I think you've unlocked some points. Um, the Center for Scientific Anomalies Research is a private center which brings together scholars and researchers concerned with responsible scientific inquiry and evaluation of claims of anomalies and the paranormal. The center will advance the interdisciplinary scientific study of alleged and verified anomalies, act as a clearinghouse for scientific anomaly research, create an international and public network of experts on anomaly research, through publication of the CSAR Directory of Consultants, publish a, a journal, uh, Zetetic Scholar, a newsletter, and Anomalistics, the CSAR Bulletin, research reports, and bibliographies, promote dissemination of reliable and objective information about scientific anomaly research, sponsor conferences, lectures, and symposia related to anomaly research, I did not know this was in a field of study, although I suppose I should have. And knowing it was a field of study, I sh it should have made perfect sense what the term anomalistics meant. Uh, because istics as a suffix tends to mean something related to like the study of. Uh, sponsor conferences, lectures, and symposia promote improved communication between critics and proponents of scientific anomaly research. We'll focus on study and evaluation of anomalous observations rather than on 
esoteric theory, theories offered to explain unusual but accepted phenomena. Uh, but CSAR also wishes to promote open and fair-minded inquiry that will be constructively skeptical. We recognize that scientific anomalies, where valid, may be instruments and driving forces for reconceptualization and growth in scientific theory. Interesting. So literally just like a university center focused on the study of fringe science. Uh, this appears to be at the University of Michigan because the address on here is Ann Arbor. Uh, which is where the University of Michigan is located. <laughs> the outrage plus points is comedy gold. Oh dear. <laughs> um, East Eastern Michigan University, Ips Ypsilanti, uh... just looking to see what might be interesting in here. I think the brochure was possibly the most interesting thing in here. Um, and we have a, a letter from the editor of the Zetetic Scholar. What is that word? Uh, does, if anybody uh, cares to find out why this um, publication about fringe science is named the Zetetic Scholar, I would be curious to know, zetetic is not a term that I am familiar with. An independent scientific review of claims of anomalies and the paranormal. Uh, from <clears throat> Marcello Truzzi, editor. Dear Henry, dated March 12th, 1982. Because I have reason to believe that you have a special interest and expertise in some area of scientific anomalies, I would like to invite you to join a network of consultants to the Center for Scientific Anomalies Research. I enclose a copy of an announcement about CSAR in case you know nothing about it. Being a consultant to CSAR involves no obligation on your part other than your willingness to have your name, address, and areas of special anomaly interest listed in the CSAR directory of consultants. You do not have to become a member of CSAR being listed does not even indicate that you support the views of CSAR. It simply means that you would like to be listed for the purpose of becoming part of the network of experts so that others seeking expertise might readily be in touch with you. Naturally, I hope that you might at some point wish to become a supporter of the center and become actively involved with it. But being listed as a CSAR consultant is mainly intended to increase information flow between those interested in scientific anomalies you need not even purchase a copy of the CSAR directory, though one will be made available to you for purchase at a special discount if you are listed. Obviously, the directory will list many consultants with quite different points of view, so in no sense do consultants speak for CSAR. As with its journal, Zetetic Scholar, CSAR wishes to promote information and resource exchanges between proponents and critics in the general area of anomaly research. We, re we wish to get those with such information and resources into a formal network, which can help us develop a true interdisciplinary science of anomalistics. The directory is a first step in that direction. I would hope that you have much to potentially gain and little to lose by becoming a CSAR consultant, so I hope you will fill in the enclosed application form and join our list of consultants. I will, of course, be glad to answer any question you might have about CSAR. Sincerely, Marcello Truzzi, PhD, Director of CSAR. P.S. If you know of other experts who might be appropriate for CSAR as consultants, feel free to copy the application form for them and have them write us for a copy. Sorry, it turned into an advertisement partway through, and so I started reading it as an advertisement rather than as a letter. Uh, zetetic is an obscure English word coming from Greek through Latin. As an adjective, it means pre proceeding by inquiry, investigating. All right, so zetetic scholar... I suppose makes sense. Regretting, yeah. 
Yeah, Abyssal, I saw that as well, and I, I decided not to linger on that letter. Um, derives from the Greek philosophical school of uh, Pyrrho and indicates extreme skepticism. Zetetic journals circulated to serious academics researching occultism and to organizations and individuals in the field. Thank you, Triamis. Yeah, it was, it was very, very ad copy-ish. Um, the Skeptical Inquirer. Uh, so yeah, apparently that's what Anomalistics is. Um, uh, uh, Bauer was connected with a group of people that were um, interested in hard science inquiry into scientific anomalies or uh, paranormal phenomena, which there's no reason not to do hard science inquiry on them. That is how you determine if they are indeed true. You uh, compile the evidence to show that they are. And if they are not true, you gather the evidence to prove that they most likely are not true. The problem is it's not possible to prove a negative. You can only prove a positive. So at best, you can um, say that to the best of the available knowledge and evidence, something is not true. Uh, it could always be proven true at a later date with new evidence, uh, whereas it's it's basically just not possible to prove a negative. Do I have two sets of gloves in here? I do. I was like, why do I have two right hands? It's because I have two sets of gloves in here. Uh, they're not not saying there's not a Mothman. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, I pulled out the gloves because there are some glossy photos in here and I didn't want to get like uh, fingerprint grease on them or oil or, you know, I didn't want to get fingers all over them. Um, all right, so we have a post-it note on the back of one of these photos. And I'm going to get ready to actually zoom in so you can see the photos better because that's the thing I can do now. But first... Let me get this positioned. Actually, let me zoom in and then get it positioned because I might, you know. Apparently, Marcello Truzzi uh, had a disagreement with the rest of the people behind the journal, and those other people started to publish The Skeptical Inquirer afterwards. Amazing. Let's see. Yeah, I think... I think that that zoom level should be pretty good for showing off an eight and a half, or um, and sorry, an eight by ten. No, a four by six uh, photograph. It's not an eight by ten. This is a four by six. Um, yeah, not terrible. So, hello, Henry. Dated August twelfth, two thousand four. When I took my grandson to the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, we ran into an old friend of yours, so I took a couple of pictures of him for you. Cheers, Dave. No idea who Dave is. Um, I've been to that museum. I will hydrate in a moment, uh, Lord Portico, thank you. So of course, In, in fact, I don't believe that this is a photo of, uh, of, of Nessie per se. Uh, this is a photo of a dinosaur. I don't know specifically which... Uh, yeah, off the top of my head, I can't remember what specific dinosaur this is, but this is from the New York History of Natural, or New York Museum of Natural History. Uh, somebody took photos because this is um, essentially a body shape that has been uh, involved in discussion of Loch Ness Monster. You read it as 8th of December. Um, yeah, which would make sense. I just, this is a US-based 
collection. And so unless it is from a sender that I know is overseas, my default is that this is August 12th. Um, Plesiosaur. <laughs> Thank you, Triamis. Uh, and here's another photograph. And while we, once I get this positioned properly, I'll let you uh, glance at this photo for a little bit while I take uh, a sip of water to satisfy that hydrate redeem. Sorry, there's a delay between um, what I do and what I see on the monitor. So I apologize for overcorrecting on the position of the photo. <clears throat> <laughs> oh, yeah, and <clears throat> Ab Ab Abyssal, the, yeah, dates are one of those weird things where we just don't have a consistent usage, uh, and there's no real reason why. Like, when you get into serious engineering um, and serious, like, scientific inquiry, <clears throat> there's a sort of global standard that is held to. Uh, if you go and look at like the field of space exploration, for instance, um, <clears throat> or in fact, um, air traffic control is a good example. Worldwide, every air traffic controller speaks English. Even if they're only dealing with local flights, air traffic controllers all speak English. That is a standard within that industry. Uh, if you're looking at, say, engineering, the metric system is the standard. Even though it's not taught in the US, if you're going to do engineering, you have to, once you get to college and you determine you're going to do engineering, you have to learn the metric system. Um, but for some reason, dates, we're not we don't standardize those. I don't understand, but how long it took food to go from mouth to stomach. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know. I, I don't know how long it would have taken to pass uh, through the throat, but um, and I don't have measurements in front of me or, a com or a, like a giraffe skeleton to compare, but giraffes have really long necks as well. And so this to me looks similar in length to that. So not inconceivable. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I'm sure it would have taken a, a while. A while. All right, I'm gonna bump back out uh, and we can look at some of the documents here. Time is weird soup. What? Because <laughs> time is fake and haunted. Um, Journal of Scientific Exploration, <clears throat> a publication of the Society for Scientific Exploration, which, as uh, was noted at the beginning of stream, was uh, something focused on fringe science. And I'm not talking about the TV series Fringe. Uh, Journal of Scientific Exploration, Editorial Office, uh, 24 September 2003. See, this is lovely, because I know what order it's in. Uh, to officers and directors of the International Society of Cryptozoology. Asterisk? I'm trying to find out what the asterisk means. Okay, you, you put in a freaking asterisk and then don't define it anywhere. There is no, um, the, 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 the letter does not anywhere define what the asterisk is. I'm assuming it is um, this listing of names sent to, but... <clears throat> it, 
it would be lovely if they had an asterisk there to indicate that that was it. Uh, giraffes only have seven vertebrae in their neck, though, same as people. Really? You don't know why you know that, but you do? Gathering random uh, facts is not a bad thing. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> we have sorely missed cryptozoology, the ISC newsletter, and ISC meetings these last half a dozen years. As enthusiasts of cryptozoology and members of the Cryptozoology Interest Group of the Society for Scientific Exploration, we offer that society's programs as uh, we offer that society's programs as an immediately available avenue for publication of cryptozo cryptozoological papers and for discussion sessions on cryptozoology in a conference setting. Perhaps active participation in SSC by a go goodly number of cryptozoologists could keep alive the spirit of ISC until ISC can itself get back on its feet. <clears throat> SSE was founded in 1982 and has held annual meetings since then, <clears throat> as well as European meetings about biennial, biennially since 1992. Its peer-reviewed journal began publication in 1987 and currently appears quarterly. We have asked the publishers, Allen Press, to send you sample copies. Interesting. The purpose of this letter, then, is to invite you to consider becoming active members of SSC. It's a recruiting letter. Uh, and it's cryptozoology interest group, and to participate in arranging sessions at meetings to solicit manuscripts for publication in the journal, and to serve as uh, reviewers of such manuscripts, and generally to use the resources of the society to advance the interests of cryptozoology. Interesting. So apparently the International Society of Cryptozoology was in some sort of trouble and they reached out and said, hey, maybe your members would like to join us. A floating asterisk. That was the cryptozoology folder. Sadly disappointing. No actual like photos of, of cryptids or anything like that. Um, or even like analysis or I keep hoping that one of these folders is gonna have like him actually having notes on some question of, of cryptozoology and uh, the analysis thereof. But what is this one? Um, Society for Scientific Exploration is the label here. <clears throat> Science on the Fringe. Dear Henry, just in case you don't have this, I'm sending it. Going to Jimmy's, so won't be here Friday. Uncertain whether that is Bob or Barb, because his wife's name was Barbara. <clears throat> so it could be his wife that grabbed this for him. I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know what magazine this is from, because it doesn't say on the parts of the page that I have. Um, Science on the Fringe. ESP, UFOs, and reincarnation are treated with respect at the world's most bizarre scientific conference by Michael D. Lemonick, Gainesville. Roger Nelson's formal credentials are in the respectable field of experimental psychology, but the project he has been working on since 1998 would make plenty of scientists cringe. Nelson heads the Global Consciousness Project, which is based on the theory that emotionally charged world events will cause blips in the output of random number generators scattered around the globe. He and his colleagues believe they have already documented that effect in the aftermath of Princess Di's death, the 9-11 attacks, and more benignly in the wave of international optimism that seems to settle over the world each New Year's Day. I don't know what year this is from either, uh, <clears throat> but clearly after 2001. 
Uh, the simple electronic devices that generate the random numbers, he argues, may be picking up some sort of planet-wide field of consciousness. Nelson would have a tough time getting this stuff published in a major journal like Science or Nature, but he doesn't have to, thanks to an organization called the Society for Scientific Exploration, or SSE, which held its annual meeting outside Gainesville, Florida last week. The location, a Best Western overlooking Interstate 75, wasn't quite so lavish as the conference centers where neurologists or physicists routinely meet. Yet that didn't seem to matter for the hundred or so researchers who came to hear learned talks on, among other things, consciousness physics, astrology, and parapsychology. Here, and in the Society's Journal of Scientific Exploration, such topics are standard fare alongside research on reincarnation, UFOs, and near-death experiences. Pretty much anything that might have shown up on the X-Files, uh, or in the National Enquirer, shows up first here. But what also shows up is a surprising attitude of skepticism. We get plenty of nonsense, admits Charles Tolbert, an astronomer at the University of Virginia and the SSE's president. Sometimes you know just five minutes into a talk that it's absurd, but you also hear things that make you think. Like Tolbert, many of the scientists here are on the faculty at major universities and were doing fine at conventional research, but sometimes that gets boring. Quote, I was plodding along, adding a little to a large body of knowledge, says Garrett Modell, an engineering professor at the University of Colorado. Doing experiments on parapsychology is a lot more interesting and potentially much more important. At the back of their minds, those researchers always remember that the scientific establishment has a long history of scoffing at big, implausible ideas that ultimately turned out to be correct. The assertion that the Earth orbits the Sun. The idea that brain-wasting diseases are caused by misshapen proteins. The proposition that hand-washing can prevent doctors from transmitting disease. The claim that continents can drift across the, uh, uh, the surface of the world. All these and more were scorned at first. While SSE's members know that scorn doesn't prove that a controversial idea is right, people laughed at Darwin after all, but they also laughed at Bozo the Clown. It, Bozo the Clown is not a scientific theory. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't prove any idea, it doesn't prove an idea wrong either. What we do, says Nelson, is give everyone a respectful bear, a respectful hearing. If we think a speaker is doing bad science, we consider it our duty to criticize it. We get our share of lunatics, but they don't hang around long. Uh, given this remarkable mix of acceptance and skepticism, it's not so surprising then that Henry Bauer, the editor of SSE's journal and a dean emeritus at Virginia Tech, wrote the definitive treatise debunking Immanuel Volkovsky, whose best-selling books in the 1950s argued that Old Testament miracles were triggered by close encounters with Venus. But it's also not surprising that that same Henry Bauer has published papers arguing that scientists have ignored powerful evidence that the Loch Ness Monster is real. Nineteen ninety-eight was only ten years ago, right? Um, I think you'll find it was a little longer ago than that. Um, yeah. Actually, staying in a Best Western for your last physics conference. I mean, just because it's a Best Western doesn't mean it's a low-class place. There are some pretty nice ones. It just depends on where you are. Um, <laughs> yeah, that example. Sure is a whole sentence. Thank you for dropping the historical terms note in the chat. Um, I should probably do that over here uh, once again. <laughs> it's been updated for this stream with, uh, we may encounter words and phrases or content that are derogatory, harmful, or wildly inaccurate, either now or in their historical context. Let's see, what do we have here? Many questions to be studied. Development of species. Is this a manuscript by 
him. I would presume so. It doesn't list an author. This appears to be a draft. What is neoteny? N-E-O-T-E-N-Y. This appears to be a draft of a paper. So if someone can tell me what uh, neoteny is, I'll read a little bit of this. We'll see where it goes. <clears throat> I am a little bit nervous about it and glad we just dropped the historical terms uh, thing. And you know, if it gets <clears throat> way off base, I'll, I'll stop. But <clears throat> these are, of course, not my words. Um, Two persistent puzzles in explaining the development of our species toward that of modern human are the occurrence of homosexuality and the mechanisms that produced the extreme neotenous characteristics that many writers think enabled the attainment of our present intelligence. Neither trait seems obviously explainable in terms of contribution to rep reproductive fitness. Um, I could very easily find sources that would argue against that statement. Uh, and the fact that there are many examples in uh, nature of societal interactions among creatures where the existence of homosexuality as a trait ex like has a place within a societal structure of, of organisms. Um, Neoteny, staying in infantile state for longer. Also, the retention of traits in older creatures. Got it. So the, re, like, uh, the fact that it takes multiple years for humans to achieve maturity. Gotcha. But yeah, like if you look at uh, even human cultures that have not been influenced by um, Christianity. If you start looking at cultures as they existed before Christianity uh, was forced upon them by um, colonial expansion from Western Europe, um, <clears throat> many of those cultures had very specific honored roles for homosexual and transgender members of their communities. Uh, and th there was a specific place in society f that helped that, uh, or helped that society to function better. And um, when you look at biological imperatives and explore like biological determinism, uh, evolution, things like that, there are many scientists who have identified multiple reasons for homosexuality to exist. I am not an expert in that area. I'm just saying um, I can, like, I know the research is out there to directly refute that sentence with regard to um, neither trait seems obviously explainable in terms of contribution to reproductive fitness. Uh, and there is definitely research out there that explains why both of those traits exist with regard to reproductive fitness. Uh, a non-human example is also something like domestic cats who only seem to retain a lot of vocalizations for humans. Wild cats don't keep those behaviors. Yeah, okay. Uh, it could be argued that both would produce deleterious effects, the latter at least proximately. The benefits of high intelligence are obvious, but not so obvious are the immediate benefits of a neotenized individual in the harsh environmental conditions and in intraspecies competition that prevailed 50 millennia ago. Any degree of neoteny displayed by an individual with the consequent developmental delays toward the adult state at which reproduction occurs, the reduction in strength, the dependence on at least some nurturing and special protection for a longer time, appears hardly to be an advantage. Our period of development in the range of two decades seems absurdly long and chancy, and is th that period of time, two decades, is a very culturally defined period of time. 
biologically speaking, humans reach sexual maturity well before two decades have passed. Closer, in fact, to one decade. Um, somewhere between like 11 and 13 years old is when humans start to reach sexual maturity. Uh, societally, it has been defined as longer uh, for very good reasons across multiple cultures, but biologically speaking, his citation of, of two decades is not accurate. Um, and yeah, if it took two decades to reach sexual maturity, that might seem a little absurdly long. Uh, physical strength must have been important in dominance conflicts between adults and sub-adults as well. For youthful individuals who were more gracile, the disadvantages must have been considerable. Sorry, I just want to say, as a note, there was a story recently in the news in the United States of a 10-year-old uh, girl who had become pregnant. It is not possible to become pregnant unless you have reached sexual maturity. Um, <laughs> I'm sure our dear Professor Bauer would insist his societal biases have no bearing on his very rational research. You're probably correct, Key Squared. Um, and Abyssal, even if we've moved on uh, reading-wise from the topic, you're welcome to comment uh, on anything we've been looking at today. You just might have to contextualize, otherwise I might not understand what you're commenting on. All professors are inherently objective keepers of all truth and knowledge. Yeah, Portico. Um, sure. <clears throat> Even for an adult male, the lower physical strength seemingly would offset intellectual gains hunting acumen, social wisdom, etc., in those environments. If neoteny and intelligence are close to, closely related, a group of neotenized individuals would have a survival advantage only after neotenization had proceeded sufficiently relative to other groups to make a difference in intertribal warfare. I'm not sure I even understand what he's claiming in that sentence. Of course, when considering homosexuality, there are difficulties in explaining why it is not counterproductive to reproductive fitness. Uh, that has been explained by multiple researchers uh, in the biological sciences and the social sciences. That is, even to be able to say that it is a neutral trait ha that has persisted, most suggestions posit altruistic kin selection. Um, Subadult. You mean kids or teens or young adults? Yeah, that's an unusual term or phrasing. A part-time professor speaks only true things and hasn't... Sure, Portico. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, I really have no idea what his argument about neoteny and intertribal warfare is. Um... This essay is not concerned with discussing non-reproducing homosexuals. The homosexual behavior addressed here is temporary, even sporadic, and is displayed among those males that eventually mate and reproduce. It can be called intergenerational and occurs when there is some disparity in age or among adults, or, or sorry, among youths, adolescents of the same age. Typically one or both of the partners are not fully adult. Perhaps pseudo-homosexuality is a useful term? The literature is extensive in depicting the appearance of pseudo-homosexuality in cultures widely spaced in time, geography, and in degree of civilization. Uh, okay. You have successfully attempted to put a disclaimer at the beginning of your statements and have indeed actually said nothing so far. 
Even this limited parameter considers behavior that requires evolutionary explanation. At best, it reasonably could be regarded as a waste of time and energy diverted from reproductive activities. It would not do to regard it as a merely neutral trait that just happened to tag along. I'm curious what the commentator says. I love the, I'm going to read the, the comment in red from the reviewer. Um, you don't think Twitch will let you spam the historical terms command as fast as you need to keep up? Yes, he is simultaneously bigoted and incoherent. Uh, the, the commentary on the side here for this part is, where does sheer pleasure come in? Music, uh, recreational reading, travel, etc., etc. Does everything have to contribute to reproductive fitness? Age-related dysfunctions? Question mark. Uh, select as course not fine net. Oh, selection is it, it, is course not a fine net. Uh, so some reasonable criticisms there of of like. Does everything have to be term, uh, defined in terms of reproductive uh, productivity? Um, uh, creatures sometimes do things because they like them. Uh, but also, yeah. Um, the concept of children's stories and like teenagers didn't really exist for a long time. Divisions got finer over time. Yeah. Indeed. Um, okay. So, still, okay, even this limited parameter considers behavior that requires evolutionary. At best, it reasonably could be regarded as a waste of time. And then he moves back into neoteny. So, literally barely says anything there and manages to be very insulting. Uh, as for neoteny, what was the motor that drives the drove this process, two of the explanations have been offered. Case selection and sexual selection? I don't know what case selection is. Gould suggests case selection as an explanation. He shows uh, slowed development as a common trait of case strategists. Further, he says, I have also tried to link case selection to what we generally regard as progressive in evolution, and I regard human evolution as a strong confirmation of these views. Case selection hypothesis may eventually be shown to be sufficient, but the appearance of neoteny nonetheless remains generally regarded as a mystery. Lovely. You have cited case selection, and then uh, you move into a paragraph where you appear like you're going to let us know what case selection is, and then you quote somebody about case selection without actually giving us any information about what it actually is. So, grand. Oh boy. Uh, sexual selection has been suggested. Some writers have offered an explanation suggesting male preferential attraction to more neotenized females. In David Brin's words, because you always want to cite a science fiction author in your scientific paper, um, some degree of neoteny of physical appearance is an ob obligate attraction trigger. Simons cites Williams in Sex and Evolution 1975 that, quote, age is probably the most important determinant in human female attractiveness? So, the author, who we presume is the, um, uh, whom we pr presume is Bauer, it's, there's no actual name on it, so we can't say for sure, but we presume that this is his manuscript, is arguing that younger women, younger females, uh, females with more 
infantilized characteristics are biologically more attractive to human males. That's how they sort the Ks. To get an entire box of special ones was not worth it. That's a great, great way. You feel like he realized the whole topic was too complicated and was making him think uncomfortable thoughts about how not everything might be related to breeding and just noped out of it back to the other topic. Exactly. Like, he spent, like, one paragraph on homosexuality. I don't know if he's going to go further into that. I'm not sure I want to know at this point. Um, yeah, Key Squirt, I like your, your comment. Ew. <laughs> Indeed. Um, oh, boy. Yeah, he just keeps going on neoteny. More neoteny. He literally has like two paragraphs about homosexuality where he says there's no biological reason for its existence. Wow. Yeah, um, this is in the folder on the Society for Scientific Exploration, which is the journal that he edited and published about pseudoscience. I think I'm done with this folder. Because I'm not specifically researching uh, the topics that we encountered there, and therefore I don't have to spend more time with it. At the same time, I do think it's important for archives to have objectionable materials like that so that people have them to reference when they're doing research on people's views in the past and things like that. Um, can we see the inflation theory doc? Uh, key squared, I can try. I will attempt to find whatever that was. <clears throat> Inflation theory e implications for extraterrestrial visitation? Is that, that, okay. Uh, J. Deerdorf, B. Uh, Hasek, or Haish? I'm sorry, I'm uncertain exactly how that is said and B. Maccabee, and H. E. Puthoff. Uh, I'm probably just going to read the abstract here. It has recently been argued that anthrop anthropic reasoning applied to inflation theory reinforces the prediction that we should find ourselves part of a large, galaxy-sized civilization, thus strengthening Fermi's paradox concerning where are they? Furthermore, superstring and M-brain theory allow for the possibility of parallel universes, some of which, in principle, could be hab habitable. In addition, discussion of such exotic transport concepts as traversable wormholes now appears in the rigorous physics literature. As a result, the we-are-alone solution to Fer Fermi's paradox based on the constraints of earlier 20th century viewpoints, appears today to be inconsistent with new developments in our best current physics and astrophysics theories. Therefore, we re-examine and re-evaluate the present assumption that extraterrestrials, or their probes, are not in the vicinity of Earth, and argue instead that some evidence of their presence might be found in certain high-quality UFO reports. The study follows up on previous arguments that, one, Interstellar travel for advanced civilizations is not a priori ruled out by physical principles and therefore must be practicable. And two, such advanced civilizations may value the search for knowledge from uncontaminated species more than direct interspecies communication, thereby accounting for apparent covertness regarding their presence. You were wondering if the article was as bizarre as the title suggests, and the abstract confirms that it is.
I mean, it, it, this seems like a perfectly valid topic to explore. Um, it's the, our, uh, why haven't we found aliens? Uh, if I'm understanding. I was reading out loud, which means that I didn't fully retain everything that just came out of my mouth. Uh, so I may have missed something, but it didn't seem an unreasonable topic for exploration, um, or particularly out there to me. The ever-recurring question of why Earth has seemingly not been visited by extraterrestrials has received considerable discussion under the topic of Fermi's paradox, uh, originated as a quip by Enrico Fermi to colleagues in Los Alamos over lunch one day in 1950. Whether one assumes the existence of only one other civilization or of many alien civilizations in our Milky Way galaxy, and whether one assumes colonization involving interstellar travel at near light speed or far below, diffusion modeling predicts colonization or at least visitation of all habitable planets in the galaxy on timescales of tens of millions of years far less than the approximate 13 by 10 to the 9th power year age of the galaxy itself. Thus the paradox, where are they? Theoretical possibilities unknown to Fermi make the paradox even stronger today. One can now rationally conjecture about prospects afforded by adjacent M-brain universes. Indeed, if the multi-dimensions underlying superstring and M-brain theory are correct, there could be inhabited universes separated from our own by minute Ortho orthogonal distances, but sorry, by minute orthogonal distances. Also, also anthropic reasoning has recently been applied to inflation theory, arriving once again at the conclusion that we should find ourselves within an enormously larger galactic civilization. While the we are alone solution to Fermi's paradox was once a seemingly valid one, the answer is now incompatible with the infinite universe and random self sampling assumption consistent with inflation theory. We thus find ourselves in the curious position that current cosmological theory predicts that we should be experiencing extraterrestrial visitation. At the same time, current physics and astrophysics suggest that such visitation may not be as impossible as had been thought. I, I actually think this sounds like a really interesting paper, um, but... I, I also find it a very interesting topic to explore of like, okay, we are unaware of any evidence of visitation having happened, but statistically it should have. So have we just missed it? Or what other reason could there be that we're unaware of any, any visitations? So it seems like an interesting topic to explore. I'm uncertain exactly what they're trying to prove with the paper. Generally, you have a point to make with a paper, and I don't know what theirs is. Um, brains do not work that way. Insofar as, like, uh, alternate universes, you mean? You're not even arguing with their conclusions about aliens, which don't actually sound unreasonable, just not actually related to the things they're taking as data for them. Gotcha. Assume that anyone would be bothered to visit us here at the ass end of the Milky Way. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of possibilities. Uh, intelligent life could be rare and just life generally could be, pop, uh, could be common. It's an interesting thought experiment and it is definitely something um, that captures the imagination. I mean, anybody who, like me, really enjoys science fiction, um, that, is, that is a topic uh, that gets hit on a lot. We are um, about 20 minutes from the end of stream, so I'm, I'm going to glance at a couple more things. We're going to see what we find. If, uh, again, if there's anything in particular in boxes 1, 2, 3, 8, 9, or 15 that you want me to get to, before the end of stream, do let me know. Otherwise, um, I'm probably going to end up focusing mostly on specifically the folders that I had pulled from other boxes. Um, the burden of Bigfoot. Professor's research makes him a campus outcast. Uh, Pocatello, Idaho. 
Jeffrey Meldrum holds a PhD in anatomical sciences and is a tenured professor of anatomy at Idaho State University. He's also one of the world's foremost authorities on Bigfoot, the smelly ape man alleged to roam remote woodlands around the globe. And Meldrum firmly believes the shaggy brute exists. That makes him an outcast on the campus, where many scientists are emb embarrassed by what they call Meldrum's pseudo-academic pursuits, and have called on the university to review his work with an eye toward revoking his tenure. Okay, but like, the whole purpose of tenure is that once you've got it, <laughs> you can research in whatever direction you want to go as long as you're meeting the standards as stated. Uh, so... Uh, Meldrum, 48, spends most of his days in the laboratory in the Life Sciences Building, analyzing more than 200 plaster casts of what he contends are Bigfoot footprints. For the past 10 years, uh, this was from 2006, so uh, for the past 10 years, he has added his scholarly sounding research to a field full of sham videos and supermarket tabloid exposés. It used to be. You went to a bookstore and asked for a book on Bigfoot and you'd be directed to the occult section, right between the Bermuda Triangle and UFOs, Meldrum said. Now you can find some in the natural science section. Uh, Martin Hackworth, a senior lecturer in the physics department, called Meldrum's research a, quote, joke. Do I cringe when I see the Discovery Channel and I see Idaho State University Jeff Meldrum? Yes, I do. Hackworth said he believes he's taken up the cause of people who have been shut out by the scientific community. He's lionized there. He's worshipped. He walks on water. It's embarrassing. Uh, John Kaczynski, Dean of Arts and Sciences, said there have been grumblings about Meldrum's tenure, but no formal request for a review. Quote, he's a bona fide scientist, Kaczynski said. I think he helps this university. He provides a forum for, of open discussion and dissenting viewpoints that may not be popular with, with the scientific community. But that's what academics is all about. Anyway. <laughs> Does not have tenure and therefore is not a guardian of, of, of objective truth. Interesting. Uh, let's see what else we have. This is, that was in this folder of like issues of stuff or publications and things from the Society for Scientific Exploration, which is that uh, organization that Bauer helped to um, found and run that was focused on um, pseudoscience uh, and the publication thereof. Um, lots of member directories. We're not particularly going to show those on stream because those are going to have some uh, likely have some contact information that potentially could still be valid at this point. Uh, probably should be restricting that information um, under current privacy guidelines for archival collections. But um, as we reach the end of stream, I would just like to remind everyone <laughs> historical terms as we review unedited historical documents on archival adventures, we may encounter words and phrases or content that are derogatory, harmful, or wildly inaccurate, either now and, in, or, and or in their historical context. Please feel free to step away from the stream as desired for your own safety and well-being. Uh, next, what Joseph Martin didn't say, a manuscript by Henry Bauer, September 12th, 1990. I'm grateful to Charles Goodsell for this opportunity to voice some opinions. It goes without saying that neither Charles nor the center should be held responsible for those views, nor should the departments to which I belong. My first impulse to write the book came from wanting to share some extraordinary experiences. I thought that would be instructive for those who haven't done any administrating. Er, administering. When I became dean and looked for useful things to read, I found almost nothing. Most of what I came across was abstract generalizing, banal, platit banal platitudes. 
I thought it would be better to describe some actual events and then argue why the actors should behave in certain ways, so I didn't set out to present a coherent statement about university administration. Today I'll try you out on a few of the points that I might have made in such a more general discussion. First, a nutshell definition of what an administrator's job ought to be. To take responsibility for making the system work, with the emphasis on taking responsibility. That subsumes various things Joseph Martin wrote, like keeping to the spirit of rules rather than the formula, being a facilitator rather than a rule quoter. It summarizes what's chiefly wrong with so many administrators, who hide behind rules in the attempt to avoid being responsible. But of course, they're still responsible. So this is um, regarding a book that he wrote um, about university administration. I'm trying to th find out. I'm just going to do a quick little glance here, uh, see if we want to spend any time on this. Um, I just want a summary, review, something. Let's see. In this lighthearted yet serious look at the trials and tribulations of an academic dean, Joseph Martin recounts stories that may astonish many members of the academic community, but will sound hauntingly familiar to other deans. He describes the dean's role in such matters as tenure decisions, budgeting, affirmative action, and coping with unreasonable demands of faculty members, department chairs, vice presidents, parents, and students. His characterizations of typical faculty members will delight academics, except perhaps when they read about themselves. Um, so that, I, I don't know. It, it was a book he wrote under a pseudonym. Um, oh, hi, Hannah. Um, I'm actually not going to spend a lot of time on that because that is not pseudoscience. That is about academic administration, so I'm going to move on from that. Um, Miscellaneous on or unorthodoxies, the myth of, myth of the scientific method, um, and then another one about his revealing who he was from the pseudonym. Um, let's look at miscellaneous on unorthodoxies, because, hey, we have a photograph. I actually think it's a postcard, not a photograph, but it's still kind of glossy, so I'm going to glove up. Oh, a question. Can you speak to the value of maintaining a record of documents that may not conform to current understanding of the world? Um, <clears throat> oh, and I love Abyssal's response. It, that seems inherently valuable. Um, so ultimately, uh, I would say it's worth preserving for history um, inaccurate information, partly because, or, or, or partly like retaining it alongside contextualizing information that explains why it's been disproven or why it is not. Um, considered to be good information anymore. Um, the reason being, if you destroy it all, you lose that history and it's, there's more chance that it comes back up with people claiming it's true. That can still happen. We have plenty of evidence. Plenty of evidence, hundreds of years of evidence proving that the Earth is globe-shaped and is not spherical, but round. Um, and yet, there are people today, and a, a growing number of them, who claim that it's flat and claim to have 
proofs to show that it is. Um, so with regard to other things, uh, historical things where uh, one of the topical areas that I've encountered with regard to we should preserve it uh, is with regard to like Confederate statues in the US. Um, it's great that they're being taken down, but they shouldn't be destroyed. They should be moved into a museum environment and contextualized to explain why they were put up in the first place because they went up a hundred years after the war ended uh, and were put up by people who were not alive when the war happened uh, to honor people for, uh, in order to drive public opinion in certain ways with regard to political power in this country. And like, there are historical reasons why those statues were put up. And so destroying them and pretending they never existed is not a service to research and is not a service to history. Keeping them and putting them in an environment that properly contextualizes them and provides the facts about their existence, um, allowing for people to research about them and um, uh, like that is much more beneficial long term. So, like I think I think having copies of disproven stuff in an archives environment where it can be contextualized is great. Having copies of disproven stuff in a general library collection not great because it doesn't get contextualized there. Some of the flat earth proofs are hilarious. People discover the same things again if you destroy historical context. No, no, we already discovered this. Then disproved it, yeah. So I hope that answers the question. Um, I'm curious what this post these postcards are. Oh, actual postcards that have writing on the back of them. So let's see. Um, Rothsundet, Norway is the location on this one, on the photo. I don't know that the photo has anything to do with um, scientific unorthodoxies, but the postcard text is, Dear Henry, a nice place for denizens of the deep, uh, but none here. The only one my friends have heard of is in a lake called... Sorry, I need to make the text slightly bigger if I'm even going to attempt to say this word. It has a lot of letters. Is in a lake called... Seljordvantet? Uh, nope. Sel Seljordvantnet. Sel I don't know. Seljordvantnet? I'm uncertain how that is pronounced. It is uh, a language that I have very little familiarity with. I did my best. Uh, in the county of Telemach. Telemach, about 120 kilometers west and 100 kilometers south of Oslo. I'm content to watch... Beitstadt Fjord. I think it's Beitstadt Fjord. Rise and fall and be resident philosopher. Former uh, helping my friends with their farm and doing some reading and writing. Hope all is well in Blacksburg. Apologies for um, poor Norwegian pronunciations there. Uh, then we have a postcard here of Loch Ness. Loch Ness. I don't actually need, these are postcards. They're designed to be touched by human hands, but. Um, Dear Henry, I couldn't see him. 
<laughs> See you soon, Harold. <laughs> Honestly, this might be my favorite item from the entire collection that we have seen. It's just a postcard that says, Dear Henry, I didn't see him. Uh, regarding Nessie, and uh, is a postcard from Loch Ness. I think it's great. Uh, have a, a, an email. We have printed emails here. Oh, boy. Uh, Wednesday, the 3rd of May, 2000, from Henry Bauer to... Cliff soon. Uh, so it, this is in response to, if I may trouble you, how did you happen upon my site? Any comments or critiques are welcome, bearing in mind the raw state of the site. The response was, thank you for the supportive uh, comments as well as the information about yourself. It's a small world, as they say. Perhaps my main professional interest the last 20 years has been about scientific un unorthodoxies, and some search I was doing related to that turned up the Galileo effect. Since that's a standard theme in arguments about unorthodoxies, I had to look at it. I believe my search was about HIV AIDS and that I went to your site because it was listed on Deuce Deucebergs under related sites. I don't know that site, and I know that his um, research specifically regarding, or his, um, published works regarding HIV AIDS uh, are very problematic. So I'm not gonna, not gonna be sharing them on stream because um, while I think it is important to have documentation that such things exist, because honestly I didn't even know it was a thing until I ran across it in, in our archives. Um, this is not the first place I ran across, across it in our archives, but um, until I discovered that uh, AIDS denialism existed by encountering it in the archives, I had never heard of it. Um, and rightly so. <laughs> it is something that most people shouldn't hear of, but for people who are working in the area of um, AIDS research or of support for Uh, communities dealing with the disease, um, it's important to sort of know that that exists. I'm curious about this one, the myth of the scientific method. Earlier this year, the mail at my office brought a brochure advertising videos made for university level science courses. One of them had the title, has the title, The Scientific Method, and the following description. Tracing the evolution of the scientific method, this program demonstrates the three-step process of observing, developing a hypothesis, and testing it through experimentation. It explains the value of this method and presents examples of the scientific method at work, both in the classroom and in professional research and development. On several dozen listed in the pamphlet, this of several dozen listed in the pamphlet, this video made in 1988 had won a Blue Ribbon Award at the American Film and Video Festival. I'm skimming now. There are a number of things seriously wrong with all this. Science isn't done that way and never was. Human beings don't behave that way. Insisting that scientists do provides a basis for the popular image of scientists as people who are not normal, who are capable of creating monsters and doing monstrous things without batting an eyelid. Nothing interesting about science can be understood if scientific method is thought of in that way. So wait. I understand, I guess, broadly that he's saying that the defined step-by-step -step process that we learn as kids as the scientific method is not how things are done in practice, in, in the real world. And I suppose that sort of makes sense. Um, 
but there are formal processes that are gone through with regard to the conduct of scientific investigation. And many of them are based around that. So, yeah, I'm a little confused. Yeah, no, I got that it was the postcard that you thought was a delight. I think, I think um, this is one of two folders that I know of in the collection uh, about the myth of the scientific method. And I think he's just mad that people think that, um, that the that science is that simple process of, um, of observe, come up with a hypothesis, and then experiment to test it. Um, and I think, I don't think he's saying that that is wrong. I think he's saying that that is an oversimplification of what actually happens. Which, yes, that is an oversimplification of what actually happens that is taught to school children who don't necessarily need the more complex understanding of what actual academic research looks like at a collegiate or higher level. Um, I'm not sure. I saw transparencies and thought I would I glance to see if they were things that would be interesting to look at quickly, but um, not so much. And we are technically over time, so uh, just, yeah. We didn't get to the Vilkovs Vilkovsky affair. I still don't really know what it is. But it was something that he spent a lot of time on. Something about close encounters with the planet Venus. Um, causing the miracles that are written about in the Bible. If I remember what we ran across earlier. And um, to be clear, uh, Bauer worked on disproving Vilkovsky. He did not agree with Vilkovsky. Um, he did believe in the Loch Ness Monster, did not agree, agree with Vilkovsky, and then went on to claim that HIV didn't cause AIDS. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure about his track record with regard to scientific uh, accuracy there. Overhead projectors, yeah. I've used overhead projectors before. These are, this is nice that they gave us some paper in here. Um, this one's just called anomalies, so I was just glancing to see. I wish there had been more pictures. <laughs> I enjoyed like the initial things about uh, Chessie and, and whatnot, the news articles, but even they didn't have a lot of images in them. Um, and I think that would have been kind of fun. Uh, but, you know, whatever. I am glad that we looked at it. Uh, it was certainly not... Um, this collection was not what I thought it was going to be when I first ran across the finding aid and saw that he had spent a bunch of time on, on uh, like fringe science topics like the Loch Ness Monster and, and other, th like Bigfoot and things like that. Um, I saw that and I was like, oh, this could be really cool. Um, and I think actually some of the stuff about the Loch Ness Monster was kind of cool. Um, but he was a much more problematic figure than I realized when I initially said, Great, we'll do that as a topic. But I'm willing to share it. It's just like, 
Uh, definitely some of his material was not stuff I want to get into. It's not stuff I want on my channel. It's not discussions that I want to get really deeply into. Um, just because that's not the environment that I try to cultivate. Um, which is why we didn't show off a lot of like the AIDS denialism stuff. Uh, but not acknowledging that it exists, I think is also problematic. Like, we had fun looking at the Loch Ness Monster stuff. Um, I'm willing to acknowledge that there were other much more problematic things that this person also uh, has in his papers. So hopefully that was uh, acceptable um, and you were able to have a, a good time attending stream today. Um, let me see. So I don't know, Hannah. Um, I don't know if any of his scientific research was used uh, and cited. I assume at some point something must have been since he was um, a tenured professor at Virginia Tech and ultimately became a dean here. Although he was a tenured professor of chemistry and none of the materials we looked at today were about chemistry. Um, and he was a dean of arts and sciences, which is English and history and philosophy and stuff like that. Uh, and not a dean of any of the science programs here. Um, so I don't know. You can draw some bad sketches of cryptid sightings if that would help. Got the impression we would have been better off academically to appoint the Loch Ness Monster as a chemistry professor. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I've had the bird brooch on for a couple of weeks now. Um, I like it as well. And I like birds. I did a whole month of ornithology stuff last summer because I enjoy birds. Um, anyway, uh, so that is, that is uh, the stream on the, the Bauer papers and um, sort of scientific unorthodoxy. I wish we had had more specific like Loch Ness Monster stuff with maybe some photos or even like the cryptozoology folder. I wish that it had had more uh, like examination of other cryptids and um, like the, the, what is it? The Jersey Devil, uh, like there are cryptids all over the world. It would have been lovely to have some more material on some of them. And I had thought that that would be there, but as we discovered, it wasn't. Um, what I have coming up next week is another set of academic papers. Uh, these are the Melvin and Go papers, G-O-U-G-H. I'm not certain if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'll see if I can figure out how it's meant to be pronounced uh, before next week. Um, but uh, Melvin Go was a, an aeronautical engineer. Um, and specifically, these materials are, ba -ba -ba -ba. I just remember there's like, 1920s airplane stuff in here. Um, the collection spans 1919 to 1971, includes a wide variety of materials reflecting Go's career as a test pilot, NACA administrator, and flight safety investigator. Especially rich in materials from his years at Langley and equally rich on the topics of aviation safety and accident investigation procedures. So we are only going to be looking at the first eight boxes of that collection um, this coming week. Those first eight boxes take us from 1919 to 1956 or 59, um, 59 I think. I think it's, so like 40 years worth of material um, with a lot of folders that are like about the Spitfire, about like some of the famous like airplanes that you would have heard of if you've ever read about World War II aeronautics and things like that. He was a test pilot for some of those. Um, so the, the portion we're gonna focus on is sort of the test pilot years, uh, the first eight boxes of the collection. And then sometime next year, I think I have it scheduled in January, we'll come back and look at the, um, uh, 
the material in the collection about um, sort of aircraft crash investigation. Uh, so like the second half of the collection. Um, uh, Geek Outs, yeah, I'm sorry that you missed some, some cryptid stuff. We were looking at some Loch Ness Monster stuff at the beginning of stream. Um, so let me go ahead and uh, set up the raid because we're now 10 minutes over and I really do have to like, as much as I enjoy staying on and chatting and doing all of that, I, I have to take down stuff and then uh, get ready to leave for the day because it's almost the end of the day. Uh, let me see who we're going to raid. Um, I don't see... There is not at present a Monterey Bay Aquarium on. So let's see where we might want to go. Um. Wow. There's not really anybody to head over to in the education category at the moment. So what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take us to um, a channel that we've gone to before. Uh, we were talking about Loch Ness. I'm going to take us to a Scottish streamer who is streaming uh, the game Stray currently. Um, And Stray, uh, slight spoiler, has something in it that could be considered cryptids. So some relevance at least. Scotland, cryptids, best I can do. Uh, anyway, thank you all for joining me. I hope that I see you again next week and um, that you continue to explore and learn more about history. I, I find this to be a wonderful stream. I hope you do as well. Um, so yeah. Thank you all.